Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Plan B Success. We have Fitz Kohler with us today, all the way from Gainesville, Florida. Now, Fitz runs a couple of fitness businesses. Fitness is one, and Morning Mile is another, and her mission is to tack on 10 plus years to your life. Now she's done books, she's been out there speaking, she's been out there engaging with people, and we'll find out what her journey is all about from her. So welcome, Fitz. Yeah, thanks, Rajiv. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. So in your own words, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I'm a fitness expert. I've been teaching for decades now around the globe, and I mostly teach via mass media and corporate engagements, whether as a spokesperson or a corporate speaker. Yeah, I help folks live better and longer by making fitness understandable, attainable, and fun. Uh, You know, there is a difference. We're going to talk a lot about business today. I truly believe there's a big difference between having a job and having a profession. And having a job is, there's no shame in that, but it's something you do likely on a temporarily base, a temporary basis to get by, pays the bills type thing. And then there's a profession and it's something you've invested not only time and energy, but heart and soul and to become, you know, elite force in your field and make a quality living that for me meant you know, have a house, have a car, have insurance, and be able to take my kids to Disney once a year or some sort of vacation, summer camp, you know, those type of things. So yeah, I teach fitness on a mass scale. Most of my audiences start at a thousand um, people and go upwards to quite often 35, 50,000 in a live audience and Uh, television, radio, books, magazine, millions at a time sometimes. And I have the Morning Mile School, B4 School Walking Running Program. It's in 400 schools worldwide. And it just provides students with a 30-minute window before school starts to show up, walk, or run at their own pace. It's called the Morning Mile, but it really has nothing to do with a mile. And the kids get up, get active. And because of that, they learn better, they behave better. And like everybody else, hopefully they'll live better and longer. And I also am a professional race announcer. So I man the start and finish lines of some of the largest, most prestigious running events in the entire uh, United States. So uh, Los Angeles Marathon, Philadelphia Marathon, Buffalo, Big Sur, OC. I am the voice of those races, as well as the DC Wonder Woman and Batman Run Series. So at least 65, 70% of my weekends each year, other than this year, (laughs) are taken up by traveling to wonderful places to serve wonderful people to make their race experience as um, positive and fun as humanly possible. Last but not least, I'm an author. This is my second book just published. It's called My Noisy Cancer Comeback, Running at the Mouth While Running for My Life. And that is a memoir telling the tale of how I survived my battle with breast cancer while continuing on with my passions, which were my children and my profession, I never once missed a flight, an event, or an opportunity to stand at a finish line and hug thousands of strangers. And I continued on with my corporate presentations and my work on television. I was bald, I was gray, but I was still, you know, saucy as ever. And I'm, I'm very grateful that I, I do have a profession that I'm so desperately in love with because you know, there's not many other reasons for a cancer patient to get out of bed unless you truly love what you do. That's pretty awesome. So where, where, where did this all begin for you? Your- you uh, fitness? Yeah, yeah, the fitness part of it. Yeah, so I started teaching at a local women's gym in South Florida when I was 14. Um, I had hurt my, I had injured my knee playing soccer, went to physical therapy, and then I was guided towards a gym membership so I could continue strength training and not get hurt again. And I just fell in love with it. And then I thought the instructors were super cool. And I had, I'm a worker bee, you know, I can, I can backtrack to say that I think I earned my first payday when I was five or six cleaning my dad's office. He owned a collection agency and my siblings and I would go in there and vacuum and take out the trash, et cetera, et cetera clean out the ashtrays. Oh my gosh. But that's what we did. And I just loved earning. So um, yeah, I was working at Cinnabon and 
my manager was really cranky. So I decided to leave that job and go apply at a gym. And, you know, I started teaching classes as I applied a few nights later, and it was something that came naturally to me, and I wasn't afraid of being in front of the room, and I really just enjoyed helping people. I didn't know for certain that's what I was going to do as a profession until the end of my senior year at the University of Florida. So I'm a patriot. My country means everything to me, and I thought I'd like to go into public office, maybe serve as governor, but naively, I thought, oh, you have to be an attorney to be a, a politician because basically all the politicians seem to be attorneys and I didn't know any better. Nobody corrected me. And I had an aha moment in a class where they said, make a top 10 list of things you love to do. That's just things that make you happy. You're passionate about that are fun. And then make a top 10 list of things you hate to do that you just don't ever want to do. And so on my love list, number one was sports and fitness. Number two was music. And number three was helping people. Those were the things I loved. Mm -hmm. And then on my hate list, number one was sitting down. And number two was reading. And what do attorneys do all day? Sit and read. And then mm -hmm. I looked at my love list and I thought, well, I'm already doing what I love to do. And, you know, the real uh, obstacle there is that most people only do fitness as a job. You know, it's part-time work. You work, teach a class here and there. You do personal training you know, you could have a busy schedule as a personal trainer, but you'll never get a sick day. You'll never get paid vacation. You'll never get benefits. And so fitness is often relegated to just a job. And I wanted more. I wanted two things. I wanted a, I wanted it to be a profession that provided a quality income and stability. And then I also wanted to do it on mass, mass scale. I had already, by the time I graduated, uh, undergrad, I had already hosted television shows, written articles for magazines, and I loved being able to help strangers. I love knowing that I took, you know, an hour of time here to work on a project and then mass amounts of people could benefit from it. And I, I had started getting feedback from people all around the country on how they, on how I helped them. And I was addicted to it. So yeah, I, I played create a career. The, the, the work that I do, there was no application where I could have mm -hmm. gone into a company and filled it out and said, hey, I would like to be, you know, hire me to do X, Y, Z. That that position didn't exist. So I played create a career and um, I pat my back, myself on the back for it every day because I sincerely love what I do. So how long has it been since you began? Oh, 32 years. I'm in my mid 40s. I was 14 when I started. So, yeah, it's uh, in any other career, I'd be retired. With my career, the thought of retirement is just a nightmare. I don't ever want to stop doing what I'm doing. I love it. So when you started this, you know, you obviously didn't, I don't know, did you imagine that it would grow so big? Yeah, I did. Uh-huh. Okay. And yeah. then, so when you look back at your path, right from the day when you started down the fitness path to where you are today, you know, what would you consider some of those pivotal moments for you? Um, so I can tell you that the pivot, there were some moments that guided me towards mass media and mass impact. I once had a woman, I, I, the TV show that I hosted was only in Florida and it was on three days a week. And I was really proud of that. And I had gone, I was in my little college bubble. So my college friends were, you know, Fitz is on TV and they thought it was cool, but I hadn't really been exposed to the community, the state residents at large who were also um, working out with cardio jam. And I went into a barbecue restaurant for lunch and the waitress came over. She was significantly older than me. So she wouldn't have been in my social circle, very overweight, over 300 pounds, and certainly not someone you would just on, you know, first glance imagine was exercising regularly. But she came over to serve me and she said, are you Fitz? And I said, yeah. And she goes, oh. I love your show and I do it whenever it's on and I record it when it, when, so I can work out with you on the days that it's not. And I've lost 17 pounds and I was blown back. I thought, oh my gosh, I got to help this person. I would have never met her. How cool is this? So me and the Sunny's barbecue waitress became BFFs. I was, I was smitten. And then the other pivot points for me came as a business person, because the thing I'm good at is teaching fitness. That's a natural ability for me. I'm fun. I'm, I'm dominant. I'm dominant. So I get people to do what I want them to do. 
and um, I'm caring. So I, I have those natural abilities. But the thing that I lacked was business skills. And I had to learn the hard way. So I can start by saying fear was a big factor, which is hilarious because I also spent 10 years competing as a full contact kickboxer. So while I had no fear walking into an arena full of thousands of people and standing in a ring with some chick who wanted to knock me clear unconscious, I had no fear over any of that. I was afraid to make calls and ask for opportunities. Um, there was a scenario where... <laughs> so funny to me, but people were writing a lot of magazine articles on me. I was a bit of a hot topic back in the day, but these writers would, they would always spell my name wrong, which was super annoying. And I'm sure you probably get that too, mm -hmm. the tricky name. So they would butcher my name and worse, they would make up quotes. And so when I was being interviewed with these articles, I was also giving out advice. Sure. I was an athlete, but I was a fitness professional and I was tying the two together to help people do better. And so these writers would just make stuff up and it made me look like an inept, incompetent professional and it was infuriating. So I really wanted to write the articles myself, but I was basically too chicken to ask those editors for the opportunity. So I left a particularly brutal training session, me versus four other people, which actually happens when you're preparing for a fight. I picked up a magazine at a bookstore and a beautiful, glossy, colored everything. And I was so angry because they made me look like a jerk. And I thought, gosh, I wish I could write the article. And, and, then, and then I went, gosh, dummy, why don't you ask? And here's the deal. I, I, I acknowledge the fact that I was being a scaredy cat. And I thought, well, if I call this editor and ask for the opportunity to write the article, what's the worst that can happen? He says, no, like right. that. That's the worst. Now, fear of rejection is big for a lot of people, and it was for me, but I had the revelation that, dum dum, there's no bleeding, there's no bruising, there's no broken bones or public humiliation involved in asking for an opportunity. But in a ring, hey, there's a lot of real consequences. So I went home, I picked up the phone, and I called that editor and I said, Hey, Bob, it's Fitz. Hey, Fitz, how are you doing? Great. Um, listen, I was wondering if I could write an article for you for next month's issue. And he goes, oh, yeah, that'd be great. How much do you want for it? And I thought, oh, oh my gosh, I can't believe I got a yes. And he wants to give me money. <laughs> he wants to give me money for it. So fear of asking, uh, that was a lesson learned. And so um, all, of the, all the opportunities you don't ask for, you don't get. You already fail. And really, no feels bad. but regret, that feels worse. So um, my, my game plan in life is to always take the path of least regrets. If I don't get something, it's not because I didn't put forth the effort. And then I also learned early on about negotiating, that everything is negotiating, it, uh, negotiable. So sometimes mm -hmm. I get a no, and then I think, oh, you poor, foolish person. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't have given me that no. And then I work really hard to turn that no into a yes um, by creating a win-win situation. And, and I'm okay walking away from a deal if it really isn't beneficial to me. But if I want something, I traditionally get it. And it's because everything's negotiable. So, you know, as you, as you started on this path and you, know, you started learning about business, you started, you know, you had the passion. Now you're, learn you're learning about business and then you have this vision for a grand vision for how big this could be. So at what point did you start getting help and at what point did it start taking the, the shape of a true business for you? Um, you know what? I think my business, it took shape from the get-go. You know, I had guidance. I was only 20 when I started my company and I was, I was guided by a friend who was an attorney who said, hey, and I was only personal training at the time, but he goes, listen, you don't want to get sued. Or he goes, well, you could get sued, but you want people suing you personally. You want them suing a business entity so they don't, you know, harm you for life. So I incorporated and I picked the name Fitness, and I'm very proud of that. I love my company name. It's very fitting. And uh, it was a very successful little personal training business for a while. And again, I was a college student, so I didn't have kids to feed or whatever. but. Yeah, I felt like a solid, proud business person back then. And my career has certainly evolved and it evolves all the time. You know, I knew 
even when I was just doing personal training that I wanted bigger things. I, my idol is Jack LaLanne, the godfather of fitness. Back in the 50s, he was teaching stuff that's still relevant today. And he had that household name status. And, you know, if you look at uh, Hollywood today, sure, maybe some of them have household name status, Taylor Swift. And, and she's a fine singer and she does some good. But within fitness, to achieve household name status means that I taught people something. You know, right. if everybody knows who I am means I've connected with them and hopefully guided them away from diets, pills, powders, supplements. Maybe I've taught them something that will help extend their life. So, you know, I look at Jack LaLanne and that's what I wanted. So I started off making presentations, small presentations to local groups. And uh, eventually, because of the exposure I was getting as a full contact kickboxer and other things I was doing, uh, appearing on local news segments, I started to get national news segments and corporations wanted to work with me. And, you know, it's grown and it's grown and it's grown. Now, mind you, I, my resume is mighty impressive. I have accomplished a whole hell of a lot. Do I feel done? Do I feel like oh, I've achieved? Every no, I haven't. I'm, I'm just scratching the surface. I really want to continue to shake the trees for two reasons. I love what I do. I, I really enjoy the process of my work. And then there's so many more people I want to help. So I just keep going. I lean forward. Absolutely. And what's the story of Morning Mile? So where did that come about? Yeah, I'm very proud of the Morning Mile. In fact, that's probably the greatest thing I've ever done. So I have two children that are 17 and 15 right now. Uh, back in 2009, I believe my daughter was in kindergarten and my son was three. And they had friends who were also in kindergarten. And those kindergartners, their, their moms kept saying, oh, Aiden is running before school and Susie's running before school. And I kept thinking, gosh, I wish my kids could do that. Gosh, that sounds great. I wish my kids could do that at their elementary school. And then the light bulb went off and I thought, you know what? I wish all kids could do that. That really seems like yeah, a home run. I, that's a, that'll be a game changer for society because... All too often is kids are brought up and with terrible habits. You know, obviously right now, a ton of kids are stuck on technology all right. day. They're not getting active. They're terrible eating habits. And then, you know, they hit 30 and they, they go, oh, crap. <laughs> you know, now I'm overweight and out of shape and I have to figure out how to fix this. And what really would be best is instead of fixing a problem, let's not create a problem. Let's just start them off with healthy habits that will last a lifetime. Walking and running requires very little to no skill, very little to no equipment. You know, morning milers come out and they walk really slow. They run really fast. Some of them are in athletic clothing and some of them are in dresses with cowboy boots and they're still able to be active. And it's an activity they can do until they're 105, you know, you can always get up and go for a walk if you can walk. So yeah, that's how the morning mile got started. And I paired the program with corporations so the school could have this great equipment, stereo or reward system. And then the corporation could have a little bit of A, they could do something good and B, they could have some advertising on those fields. So right now, if you sponsor a morning mile program, you get an outdoor banner on that school field, which quite often is very hard to come by that opportunity. So it'll say morning mile brought to you by Bob's plumbing, by Under Armour, you name it. We've had all sorts of different sponsors, but um, I, I've created the win-win situation. And what's really nice is I've almost never had a company sponsor only one school. So they may start with one, but they're so rewarded by it that they come back to sponsor more. And how many schools did you say the program's in right now? Over 400. That's pretty awesome. That's yeah, awesome. thank you. So what kind of a structure do you have for your companies right now? Like what kind of staff is supporting you? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, right now, <laughs> not much. So this is a very uh, rough year for me as an individual and my, com my company, as many small business people will attest to, I specialize in mass gatherings. And you know mm -hmm. what we're not having this year? mass gathering. So um, I've lost 55 events that I was hired to host. And uh, yeah, it's brutal. So uh, I normally work off of independent contractors. So I still have some independent contractors that are doing web design for me, uh, graphic design here and there, a little bit of promotion for my book. 
Um, but it's, it's a small year. I do have interns uh, from the University of Florida and they're, they're superb. They do, they, their output is fantastic. Their attitudes are great. And I give them real tasks, real work. There's nobody taking out my trash or pouring me coffee. My interns, they write articles, they do graphic design, they work social media, they help manage events when I have them. <laughs> but yeah, this, this year is weird. So I'm, I'm down on uh, what do we call it? Um, that's a bare bones crew, me. Okay. So, so let's, let's uh, talk about this year, right? So with the pandemic and what's going on, have you evolved your business in any way? Have you done more virtual events? I, I'm working on that. So I, I have done some of vir virtual events. You know, when um, March, when the world shut down, I was halfway through writing this book. And so I slammed on gas and I finished the book. And the book has been on sale since early October. And so that's, that's certainly helpful and spreading the word about my noisy cancer comeback in, uh, you know, the corporate America, because there's a lot of, there's a lot of life lessons, a lot of kicks in the can for the regular person. You know, if I could travel the country like a beast with chemo and I had mean, mean chemo radiation surgery, you could do a little more <laughs> if you're not going through those things or, you know, there, there's, there's quite a few business principles in here, but I'm also trying to expose it to the running community and cancer patients, the cancer community. This is what I hear from people that they say, I wish I had that book when I was diagnosed. So right now, every single day I get a message that says, Hey, my aunt or my uncle was just diagnosed. I, can you inscribe the book to them? So I'm working on that. And uh, I used to do so much corporate speaking every single week. And so as far as spokesperson work, I've worked with Oakley, Tropicana, Office Depot, Disney, PepsiCo, Gatorade, you know, massive companies. But as my race announcing schedule got busier and busier, I focused less and less, and less on those corporate health presentations and peak performance presentations. And so now, you know, corporations are still doing conferences. They're just doing them virtually. I'm not fearful. I'm happy to get on a plane and go anywhere, but I'm working very hard to reintroduce myself to corporate America and say, hey, if you need someone to kick your crew in the can and help them do better, be better, increase profits, increase their energy, decrease their healthcare costs, I'm your girl. So yeah, I'm, I'm pivoting. You know, I think with entrepreneurs, we don't, we don't have a safety net other than our right. own savings. And uh, my job is not to sit around and cry because all the races are canceled. My job is to pivot and figure it out. And so that's what I'm doing right now. I'm, I'm figuring it out. And when, when did you go through your cancer journey? Uh, I was diagnosed in February of 2019 and I finished treatment May of 2020. So I'm, I'm just out about six months now. You know, that's pretty impressive for you to come back with the vengeance and what you're doing, you know, it's very inspiring. Yeah, thank you. It was, uh, it was an, a very interesting year and a half and we took a lot of efforts. I, I can tell you that my doctors were awesome. So I'm a, I don't accept no, as I said at the beginning, I, I was a very, very sick person. It wasn't, <laughs> I, I look healthy now, but back then I was very sick, but my doctors never even tried to restrain me from my work, they just said, okay, we're going to figure this out. And so when the, when stuff hit the fan and I became, you know, tequila hangover sick, or like I had a, a stomach bug, which I had every day, they, they started me on IV fluids. And then I would fly to Buffalo or to California and there would be a medical team waiting for me there with IV fluids. And, you know, we just worked the system. We figured it out so I could keep going. And then no matter how sick I was, once I got on my stages, the second I stepped on the stage, almost all of my sick feelings faded, or at least I forgot about them. And uh, it was like they hit my on switch and zoop, I got to be full force, full force Fitzkohler again. And uh, the adrenaline, the runner fueled go-go juice I was running off of was pretty awesome. But again, if I were, if I were not doing a job that I loved, I would have called in sick. You know, that's the night and day difference is do you have a career that you would stick with even under the worst situations? My answer is obviously yes. I hope if you're not in that position, you find something that allows you to um, fight for your career because it matters. So you mentioned two books. What was your first book? My first book was the Everything Flat Belly Cookbook. 
300 quick and easy recipes, so blah, 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 whittle your middle. So just healthy recipes. <laughs> and obviously this book is about your journey through cancer. Yeah, it's a memoir. It's a memoir. And from what I, well, from what I hear, people say is, uh, it makes them cry, but it makes them laugh a whole heck of a lot more. And, you know, when you're diagnosed, it's interesting. It's terrifying. If you've never heard the words, you have cancer, good for you. But it's a, it's absolutely terrifying. And the second people get diagnosed, they go looking for two things, information and hope. And if you go on Amazon today and Google like cancer book, they all look so dark and gloomy and scary. This, this is not about being scary. So I got real raw. I told people all the details. You know, when I, when things started hitting the fan for me, I kept thinking, how come nobody ever tells you this? You know, I knew I'd be bald. I knew I'd feel sick and be tired, or at least I thought I would be those things I was. But nobody told me that my eyes would change colors or that I would have a skunk stripe down my head as when my hair fell out. Nobody told me all of these weird little things. And as the avalanche of side effects kept growing and growing, I sort of, you know, I was suffering, yes, but I also thought, gosh, this is kind of hilarious. People would get a kick out of it. I think they would really find it funny. And apparently they do. So it's an upbeat, you know, it could have been called Adventures in Breast Cancer, but, you know, the book is really helping a lot of people. And I, I believe it'll be evergreen. You know, it, it's relevant today, but it'll also be relevant in 2028, 2031. It's, it's a good value. And where do people find your books? So the honest answer is everywhere. It's hardback, paperback, ebook, and audiobook. You can get them wherever and everywhere books are sold. However, if you come to fitness.com, which I prefer, um, I sign every single book that's sold on fitness.com, and it, they all come with a gift with purchase. And what kind of a support system do you, did you have while you were going through your cancer struggle? It was an incredible support system. So my husband was here to do all of the, you know, appointments with me and make sure I had food and drinks. And there were times where if he didn't bring me a drink, I wasn't going to have a drink. I was in pretty bad shape. Uh, but locally, people, friends stepped up to bring meals. Um, I was in no shape to cook. So they were either giving us gift cards to Bite Squad or Grubhub, or they were bringing over prepared food. They drove my kids around. And then I never wore a wig. And I also never wore a pink shirt with a ribbon that said, hey, I'm a cancer person. I never, and I still don't do those things. Um, but people knew. And so when I was trudging through airports, gray and glossy eyed, everybody, everybody stepped out of their box to try and help me. I was, it was obvious what I was going through. You know, cancer has a look and I had it. And whether they were helping lift my luggage for me or bringing me extra snacks on the plane or extra blankets, you know, just, I never asked for anything extra, but the kindness demonstrated by strangers was so uh, heartwarming. And then, of course, my running community, you know, two things, my mom, my mom still around and she was very concerned. I don't know what's going to happen if you get really sick in Denver while you're working. And I said, mom. I work on at running events. There's always either an ambulance or a medical tent right next to my stage. I couldn't be in better. I, I don't know where, what other job you have an ambulance with right next to you, but I'm in good care. And then as well, um, my fans and friends from the running community were always stepping up, bringing me snacks and drinks and, you know, trying to keep me warm if I was holding an event where it was cold. They're just, you know, uh, sometimes Americans get, a bad rap, but boy, are we good. We are such, our country is filled with the most wonderful, generous, kind, thoughtful people ever. And I, I really uh, res was, the, was a good recipient of that last year. And I will spend the rest of my life trying to pay it forward to serve others and take care of people where they need it. Yeah. Very inspiring, Fitz. And you're absolutely right. You know, we see a lot of that uh, empathy coming out, especially during this time, during the pandemic, yeah. not, not only from individuals, but even from corporations, you know, yeah. cor corporations that were known for and always pursuing profits yeah. have kind of taken a turn during this time. Everybody's come together. Well, you know what, as business owners, we know that profit's good. Profit is not a bad thing. Right. I, 
I was recently interviewed by another business entity and they said, blah, 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 greed. And I said, I really have a problem with that because I don't think trying to earn a living is greedy. I don't think trying to earn so much for your business that you can hire and employ other Americans is greedy. And if you make a lot of money, okay, great. And I, I don't know so many homeless people that are funding wings of hospitals. You know, it's these right. giant corporations that are making giant donations, making giant strides for people in need. And obviously our wealthiest people, whatever political party you're on, those are the ones who seem to also be writing big fat checks to cancer research or diabetes or homelessness, whatever it is. So um, yeah, profit is a good thing. And I think as entrepreneurs, we should not vilify money. And I think we should be proud of our ability to earn. Absolutely. And yet there, there is that bad rap out there, um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, which I think this year it's kind of seen a turn. It's, it's kind of seen people really recognizing corporations for what they truly bring to the table. You know, very inspiring story that you have, Fitz. And thank you for sharing everything that you do with us, your journey, as well as your books. Thank you. Before I let you go, one takeaway for the listeners, anything that you'd like to share? <sighs> Do what you love, accept nothing less. Um, it's okay to change careers. You know, we talk to a lot of college students and, and fine, if you can figure out what you love from the get-go, great. But I don't care how old you are. It's never too late to um, take a fork in the road and pursue your passions. And, and if you do what you love and you do what you're good at, the money will follow. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us today. And uh, we wish you the very best in 2021 and hope to keep in touch. Thanks, Rajiv. Hey, I hope you liked that episode. Please do check out Plan B Success Podcast on your favorite listening platforms. It's also available on www.planb.live. If you're looking to learn how to podcast and learn everything there is to ideate, create, launch, and monetize a podcast, do get in touch through the website www.planb.live. And I'll be more than happy to help. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm.